Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original. So what's going to be after Go? Minnesota yeah. Opera's New Works Initiative production of Doubt by John Patrick Shanley and Douglas J. Cuomo makes its world premiere. With fantasy and fluorescent colors, Melissa Loop's landscape paintings explore what is idyllic and dark. And Soul Asylum performs at First Avenue. These artists and more, now on Minnesota Original. The New Works Initiative is a seven-year initiative which concentrates on new music. This season we are doing our second world premiere, which is Doubt, which is a Pulitzer Prize winning play by John Patrick Shanley, is the centerpiece of the Minnesota Opera's 50th anniversary. <laughs> How about ha, 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 ha? <laughs> this is going to make or break the show. <laughs> I mean, my name is John Patrick Shanley. I'm probably best known as a playwright and a screenwriter. And uh, I work a lot out of New York. I'm from the Bronx originally. And uh, I made a bit of a splash with uh, this play, Doubt, in New York, which has turned out to have more lives than a cat. Uh, and uh, so it began as a play in an off-Broadway theater and then moved to Broadway. And then uh, we made a film out of it that I directed with Meryl Streep and Philip Seymour Hoffman. And now uh, we're here at the Minnesota Opera collaborating on turning it into an opera. Impeccable. When he says, oh, woe is me in the new location, we don't need the denatural there anymore. because we can going to be exactly? So what's going to be after Go? Doug Cuomo, who I've known uh, for several years, he is doing all sorts of work. You know, he's written music for television shows. He wrote the theme to Sex in the City. Uh, he's written music for, for theater works, for movies. Uh, this is his second opera. There's a few things about Doubt that were immediately attractive to me in terms of uh, making it into an opera. John's language just on the printed page, and the play is so unbelievably musical. The idea of putting together the words and the characters and the moral questions and the music, in a certain way, there's a lot of that kind of psychological playing around with the orchestration. Franklin D. Roosevelt, wonderful president, 13 million men were unemployed. They lost hope. President Roosevelt said, You have nothing to fear but fear itself. It's an incredible experience being a part of the workshops. It's really as if time stands still, being in the presence of some phenomenal artists who are shaping what feels like could be a really important work. Right? before you, and not only right before you, but even with you, even asking, oh, can you try this so we can hear that? And, and you trying different colors and different expression and different angles or aspects to the character that might either confirm what they want to hear, maybe make them feel that it needs to be something else, or even maybe give them a new idea. It's spectacular. <laughs> Out your history books, please. Oh. Turn to page 
It's an interesting thing to watch because the words of doubt are so beautifully written and they're quote unquote operatic. I mean, the singers have arias, they have monologues in this case. They talk in duet. And John Patrick has a very musical ear. He listens to a sentence. He listens to how the sentence ebbs and flows, the, the, the high point of the sentence and the low point of the sentence. And it perfectly translates to music. Do you honestly find the students in this school to be treated like Actually, they seem fairly happy. Originally, Douglas Cuomo came to me and said that he'd been talking to the Minnesota Opera uh, and basically to himself in the mirror and saying, what should we do? Uh, and he came up with doubt as a subject that he was very drawn to. And I was interested in doing it simply because I've never done an opera. Shots are psychological, the rest of the game you're competing against the other team. I've certainly enjoyed this collaboration very much and the whole process of it. The topic and the subject matter, it's so, you know, so nuanced and so interesting, there's so much stuff going on. So it was important to have the music not tip the hand entirely. The scene with Mrs. Miller, the mother, when she comes in and talks with Sister Aloysius, that's, you know, I think one of the best scenes in, you know, in American theater in, I don't know, decades. The thing that I originally was drawn to was the title, Doubt. I came up with the title first. I had nothing else. And then I thought, oh, I'll make it about these nuns that I had when I was a kid. And then I thought, well, that's not enough for a play. That's just a slice of life. And then I thought of a priest who was suspected of wrongdoing. And I thought, well, that's the beginning of something, but it still needs another turn to it before I would even begin work. And then I thought of a mother of a child who was suspected of being molested, and what if that mother was coming from a direction that no one would predict? His don't like him. He comes to your school, and the kids don't like him. The reason for the theme of doubt is that that's how I live. Everything to me is on the table. Uh, I'm always in deliberation. The jury is always out uh, and it never comes back with a verdict because life isn't like that. Life continues to unfold and what we think we understand, we subsequently realize that we do not, that there's more contemplation uh, that any subject in our lives does, truly deserves. Uh, and that you should always leave room for other people to have a point of view. And that room might be called doubt. Well, Minnesota Opera is really known for doing new works. It's in our DNA. When it was started 50 years ago, it was started as a new works company, as part of the Walker Art Museum. It was originally called Center Opera, a company that didn't do La Boheme and Carmen, but really did Dominic Argento's work. Um, so it's 50 years later, we're still doing it. I 
think that it's very important for not only the Minnesota Opera, but every opera company to do works of our time. Uh, and that's where this piece is. It sort of tells a story of today. In working with the Minnesota Opera, I see that there's a, a real passion here for both new work and good work. Uh, and uh, there's a vibrant uh, invitation that has been sent out to artists from around the country to come here, create new things for people who live here to experience and that there is really an audience for it here. And uh, that's always an exciting prospect. What have you seen? It's unsettling to love you. It's This idea of selling utopia and selling the fantasy of a place, but then always kind of destroying it, pulling it back. So it's like I'm presenting something and I'm trying to lure the person in, but then at the same time, like, you know, there's paint splashed around or it's kind of off-putting, so it's always kind of pulling it back and not committing to the fantasy or, or denying the fantasy in a way. It seems to be really overly drawn to fluorescent colors. It's a really nice way to make something that's just not too pleasing, especially too with landscape. It's so unnatural in that natural environment, so it's creating like a counterpoint. So I started getting really into kind of pulling buildings from like Las Vegas and Dubai, th things from like all over the world and kind of mashing them together into one kind of fantasy place. When I Google them and I, I find all these pictures of these places, it's really just the same pictures over and over and over again. So it becomes this idea of the collective conscious of what the place is. And that's really has nothing to do with what like Hawaii actually looks like because it's, you know, it's this pristine spot over here and this pristine spot over there. And that's kind of what we like to think of those places, but isn't what's really there. Going to a place really kind of turns the whole idea of what I was doing on its head. I wasn't quite sure what would come out of it. I just knew that it was important for my work to move forward to start going to these places. I went to Belize. I think it ended up with like 3,000 pictures. It's just over documenting everything, <laughs> you know, and taking close ups so that um, I could remember how the trees were because, you know, each, each large tree has probably, you know, 50 other things growing out of it. You know, vines that hang off of it, and there's ferns just kind of sticking out of every little orifice. And that was maybe next to a major temple or something like that. So I was able to get the pictures everybody else gets, and then everything else around it. It took me a while, even after I got back, to think about, well, now what am I doing? Because I don't want to just make landscape paintings about a place. But I was interested in what the Hudson River School artists were doing, this idea that they went to the place and then was selling the fantasy of it. They, they kind of made an idea or an impression of the place. And so I liked that in some ways I was repeating that. A lot of times things will start to kind of come together, but they're not right where I want them. Or there's just, it, it just isn't complex enough or there's just something, there's just something missing about it. 
so I'll just sand it back and kind of almost like take it down a couple notches and then I have to essentially repaint it. Putting it on the floor and you know, using spray paint and, and kind of pouring paint on it is another way to kind of break open the paint or um, trying to keep it from being too finished or too pretty or too done or too, too realistic in a way. There should always be something a bit off about them, a little off-putting or dark. Like I really like that where you can kind of be drawn into it for the beauty or something like that, but then there's just something maybe cynical or not right about it. You know, it's, a, it's about finding that, that balance and, you know, drawing you know, in and then flipping it back out. It's something that I've always liked to do. Even in school, it was something that I saw the other kids wondering what they wanted to do and trying to figure it out. And I always just sort of knew what I wanted to do, which was basically be an illustrator. I think I'm known for a style and subject matter too. Just things that are distinctly Minnesota. Cityscapes, cycling, pinups, food, beer, grain belt, gold metal flower, Pillsbury. Those three are very iconic. They're just a really great set that goes together. So I think originally when I was first kind of starting in this business, I was known for those three. So in 2003, I met up with a collective who was doing a lot of work for First Avenue and the Triple Rock. So I started doing uh, more and more flyers and ultimately gig posters for bands. The bands started seeing and recognizing my style and work sort of just came about that way. I really like to say yes to as many people as I possibly can. And one thing that I really liked about gig posters was that it's a great little design job. They're fun and they get a lot of attention really quickly. I do work um, basically about things that I really like. And I started doing a lot of, lot of pinup kind of artwork and I got to be more well known for doing the pinup stuff. A lot of bands were contacting me to do pinup style work for them. And I've also been into cycling a lot and I started doing more cycling related pieces. This is a piece I did called Cycle Minneapolis. And it was originally done for uh, a bike art show called Art Crank. I want the pinup stuff to be part of a lot of the other stuff that I do. So I end up kind of using both, both ideas and quite a, quite a few things that I do. So I started doing more and more pieces that related back to the bicycle. Cycling is one of those things that I've always loved. I love the, the form and the aesthetic of a bicycle. I just think they're absolutely gorgeous machines. Plus they're extremely utilitarian. And one thing led to another and I started doing more cityscape related items. Um, those became kind of popular and so therefore I felt like maybe I should do more of them. on a sketch of Lake Harriet for my Lake series. I'm referencing Lake Harriet at the end of winter, so there's still ice on the lake, and uh, I want it to look more like a summer piece, so I'm going to be putting in sailboats and, and um, yeah, leaves on the trees to make it look more summery. When I'm sketching something, I'm really just, I'm, I'm sketching in 
where things are gonna be. So that's just a reference point for me um, for when I'm actually doing my final inks. When I go in and I do my final inks, I'm usually going over my sketch and I'm actually simplifying the lines that are in the sketch to be a little bit more bold and graphic. So there is a lot of hand done qualities in there. Um, I think you can really feel the, the human aspect coming out of the work. I like to use the computer as well, but I like to use it more as a tool to enhance the work, not to create the work. We're gonna print my lake series uh, that, I'm, that I'm working on. Um, we're gonna do the final color of Lake Calhoun. And uh, my boy Brian Giel, he's gonna help me out and we're gonna do some printing. So let's get started. This particular one, we're doing three screens, and we're actually doing the key line, which is the very last uh, screen for this print. Key line, otherwise known as uh, outline. Everybody's screen printing process is different, and mine is DIY. I had someone who I was working with a while back and, and, and he said, you know, being a screen printer, you wear a lot of different hats. You're a chemist, you are an engineer, you know, you're an artist, and the list can go on. And that's fantastic. I love, that's, that's part of it I just absolutely love about screen printing. I guess we'll just see where the next step takes me. I'm not quite sure yet. It's one of those things where I tend to draw things that I like and uh, whatever I end up liking next, that may be the next thing. I don't know. into the outhouse the cold night breeze into her face eyes are standing still now the moon it spills through the place she's got to wonder what it's like to be Darkness, the fingers touch the porcelain. Then pulls her pants down, the cold night holds her like a thief.
looking for a runaway train Like a madman laughing at the rain Out of touch, still insane Just as the other dealing with the pain Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.